So um, it is now my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Mr. Tommy Robinson. Also stand up. I'm a bit out of my comfort zone here. I'm used, to, I'm used to standing on the street corners and speaking to my fellow countrymen. I've been involved in the counter jihad movement for three years. I was unaware there was a counter jihad movement prior to that. And I want to thank every one of you that have been fighting the fight for a lot longer than myself. It first come to my light Growing up in Luton, Luton is known as the heart of militant Islam, the birthplace of militant Islam, the place where the 7-7 bombers boarded their trains, the fertiliser bomber, the Stockholm bomber. Our soldiers, Scott Muntridge is from my estate, he died in Afghanistan. My, Michael Swain lost his legs in that war. When our troops were returning to our town, they were met by this man, al Mujahideen, Islam for UK, Muslim Against Crusades, they were met with hatred, they were called baby killers, they were called murderers. The police, I was there that day, I watched it, the police's response. They didn't search them, they didn't stop them, they didn't stick cameras in their faces, and they didn't draw their batons on them. They drew their batons on us. They turned on us. In response to that, we decided. Do yeah, you do that. Yeah. I'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> In response to that, we decided to organise a demonstration. As Lutonians, being from Luton, having our friends lose their legs and our friends die, it meant so much. That day, my friend's mum was there. Their families were there. To us, that was a terrorist attack. That's what they'd done that day to our, well, to our soldiers' homecoming parade. Now, when we turned up, to, which was a community, it was a community. It was my aunties, it was my uncles, it was men, it was women. When we turned up, we were stopped, we were searched. We had police put their hands in our pockets. We had cameras in our faces. We had police on horseback. We had coshes. We were treated like the criminals, a complete two-tier system to the way the Islamist group were treated. If that wasn't bad enough, we knew that certain factions, Nazi factions, such as the National Front, backward scum, were trying to attach themselves to our movement. So we held placards and banners that read, National Front scum, go to hell. Islamism, Nazism, opposite sides of the same coin to us. It's not welcome in our town. One of my best friends... <laughs> one of my best friends, a little black lad, West Indian lad... Craig. He lost his teeth. A police officer come past on a horse and knocked his teeth out of a cosh. Now, if we weren't already furious enough, you could have lit a match and Luke would have blown up at the response of what was going on. We were, we were fighting for equal rights. We were being treated completely unfairly. Then, this same Islamist group, we was on the, I was on the computer, and six weeks after they'd done this to our troops, they held an Islamic rally in Birmingham, which is England's se second city. They held a big banner that read Jesus was a Muslim. They stopped a young boy called Sean, who was 11 years old, without his parents' permission. They stopped him in the shopping centre, they got him up on stage, and they made him repeat after them. They converted him to Islam. In the city centre, with police officers, councillors, everybody watching. Now, we all know the consequences of being an apostate of Islam. And nobody said anything. Nobody criticised it. So we then made the decision to leave Luton and go to Birmingham. Now, when we went to Birmingham, we were met with Islamic politicians, clenched fists, saying, smash them, smash them, smash them. They got down on their knees, they prayed, and then they run through the streets and they beat every non-Muslim senseless. We were kicked and battered off the streets in our first demonstration. The pictures were across national newspapers. This is when I realised what we were up against. Of English lads on the floor with Muslims in the air, two feet on their head. And under the picture, it read, a fascist is attacked by anti-fascists. 
And it, that's when I thought, what are we up against? I didn't, I, three years ago, I was a working class lad from a working class town. Left wing, right wing, didn't care. Politics, didn't care. Getting on with my life. I didn't actually have any interest in it. I couldn't believe the media's response from, from what had happened then. And from that, the whole country read the newspapers. We launched the English Defence League. We then looked on the internet and we saw a Christian graveyard being bulldozed. Desecration of Christian graves to make way for a mosque. Okay? Nobody saying anything. So we then made, we said we'll leave Birmingham. We tried three times to highlight the issue of the, the young lad called Sean. We left Birmingham, we went to Manchester. Now after everybody seeing the consequences of standing up against Islam, how many middle-aged female school teachers are going to come out on the street and oppose militant Islam? You're going to get your head kicked in. That's what's going to happen. That's the standard. That's what's happening across Europe. They beat you. They rule with fear and intimidation. They will attack you. So what happened then, we left Birmingham, 60, 70 of us in Birmingham. We went to Manchester, and 2,000 English men turned up. 2,000 English men turned up with the attitude that you're not beating us into submission. You are not silencing us. We sometimes get criticised for our... I don't know if it's our image problem. We have a bit of an, I an image problem. <laughs> the sort of person that turned up in Manchester, and I'll never condemn him, is a man that's prepared to stand up. And a man who's prepared to stand up for what he believes in and not be beaten off the street. It was never going to, to me, it was never going to be doctors and nurses that takes on militant Islam. Okay? There's a certain sort of person that will go on the street and oppose it, and a certain sort of person that stands on the front line for our country in, a, in our armed forces. Someone that's not going to back down to them. Now, what has come with this, and it's been a, a complete three years of mayhem, which has shocked me, is the persecution from the police and the authorities, the political policing. It started off with myself. It started off, what they do is, they, after our first demonstration in Luton, they kicked my doors off. They, they, they chose one person from each estate and they kick their doors off, because that instills fear into all the other kids on the estate and all the other people on the estate that you can't do that because you'll have your door kicked off. You'll be arrested. No charges are brought. From that, I was flying out to Edinburgh. I was at Luton Airport. I was stopped by Special Branch. I was brought in by Special Branch. Fifteen police officers went to my mum's house. Fifteen went to, to my wife's house. They went there. I was arrested on suspicion of criminal damage. Thirty pound criminal damage. Thirty pound. 30 police officers, special branch for a 30 pound criminal damage in a hotel room. And they seized all my mum and dad's computers. They seized all of our phones, okay? And after three weeks, they dropped all charges. Now, the persecution continued, and it was enabled to break, I believe, break me, silence me. When that didn't work, they turned up three months later. And there were local police officers who come into my house, and the first thing he said was, Sorry, Stephen, I'm sorry. I said, what do you mean, sorry? We're arresting you, and we're arresting your wife in front of your children. So they, I was arrested, my wife was arrested, and basically we're arrested on suspicion of money laundering, financial irregularities in front of our children. And that's when it thought that it's not working on me, so now they go for my family. They go to my mum. They've been to my nans. They've been to my cousins. And it continues on. And the persecution, which has been shocking to me, which is political policing, is just, I, I've had a financial restraint for two years. I've had all my assets and all my money frozen. I have not been for a judge. These are the tactics that they will use to silence us for standing up against fascism and extremism. We have an Osman warning. Some of you may know an Osman warning. An Osman warning is an official government warning that you are going to be killed. Okay? The first one I got, they gave me mine, they called me to the police station, and in it, they said, we advise you to leave Luton for the foreseeable future. Take your family. Then they said, I need to see your wife. I said, why? Because they need to give my wife one. So my wife was pregnant at the time. So when the officer came around my house, he's telling my wife who's pregnant that Muslims want to kill her. And I said, how long have you been a police officer? 20 years. Have you ever told a pregnant Muslim woman that Christians want to kill her? For what? This is the problem. No, you haven't. This is the Osman warning. And... Islam rules to me with fear and intimidation. You show any weakness, they will run all over you. The first thing I've done after my husband warning was walk straight into Luton Town Centre, and I walk into Luton Town Centre every single day since, because we will not be scared into intimidation, which is what they do. And men and women follow courage to me, that's the way I see it. They follow courage. Our politicians, 
I don't see any courage. I see courage in Gert Wilders. I see courage in everyone that stood here today. And I see your countrymen and women will follow you. Our countrymen and women have followed us. The English Defence League, I believe, and now the British Freedom Party, has written its name in history. It's written its name in history. We may be demonised, slandered at present, but everything that's happening now will be looked back upon in history. I don't believe the next generation of youth will ever forgive us if we stand by and do nothing. They'll never forgive us. I don't know how many people have seen the recent story about a lady who's pregnant in Britain. Her husband is a serving soldier in Afghanistan. And when her baby is born in four weeks, the authorities are going to take it off her. They're going to take it off her because for the fear it's going to be radicalised through the English Defence League. They're going to take her child because of her political belief. We have Abu Qatada, we have Anjem Chowdhury, we have terrorists, convicted terrorists. They would not dare talk about taking their children. Do I think they'll take her child? To be fair, she's fled the country. A lady, a mother, has had to flee the country through fear of having her child taken off her. The point is, whether they take her child or not, their objective has worked. How many other mothers who stand on the street with us will now stand on the street with us? They've installed the fear the worry of losing your child. That's what all this is about, installing the fear that you can't speak up. You can't say anything because look at the consequences. Look what will happen. They will kill you. They will attack you. I don't know who saw last... We had a demonstration in Dewsbury last Saturday and three hours before the demonstration, a car was stopped. It had a Taliban IED in the boot. It had guns and ammunition and they were on their way to our demonstration to attack maim and kill our supporters. They've been arrested this week. Another seven have been arrested. That is, to me, the finding moments in history change the direction of a country. Bloody Sunday changed the whole direction of Northern Ireland. I would not like to lose any supporters or lose my life myself, but I believe if attack was made in Britain on our demonstration or on myself, I believe England would rise up. I believe there will be a moment like this. If we don't change what's happening in 20 to 30 years, there will be millions getting killed. There will be millions getting killed. And I, met, I met with a vicar who, he told me, I believe you'll be a sacrificial lamb. I believe maybe we will be a sacrificial lamb. But what we do at the same time is nothing in comparison to what our armed forces do every day. They go out and face it every day. Guns, bullets, every single day. Fighting for our freedom, for our freedom of speech, for democracy. So it is our duty, it is every man's duty, every woman's duty to stand up and stand up for what we believe in. Some people may see, I've been, I'm a convicted football hooligan, yeah? Apparently. I was arrested for swearing outside a football stadium, okay? Two police officers said I swore. I said I didn't. It went to court. I get convicted for swearing. <laughs> then it comes into light the reason why. Then this story goes across the media. I'm a convicted football hooligan now. That demonises our movement straight away. The leader's a football hooligan. And I don't claim to be the moral compass for Britain or for Europe or to be polishing my halo. I've never been an angel and I never will, probably will be an angel. But I'm a normal working class lad from my, from my town. But then it comes into light. The football team that I follow, Luton Town, as rubbish as they are, yeah, they are, um, our football stadium is in the heart of Berry Park. Berry Park is the Islamic ghetto of Luton. I've been going there for 20 years. Now that it's common knowledge that I'm the leader of the English Defence League, Deputy Vice Chairman of the British Freedom Party, the police have a dilemma. How do they police me attending a football match? I'll tell you how. They take away my freedom to go to a football match. Rather than deal with the potential riot, of a local extremist, Islamist, violent community, they'll ban me for swearing. Did I swear? No, I didn't. Now I'm banned for three years. Part of my ban is I'm not allowed into the Islamic area every Saturday, I'm not allowed into a town centre, and I'm never allowed to go to football. I have to surrender my passport every single game, and I have the, we have a police officer called Mohammed Hussein, who's a Muslim police officer. They solely work for their community, that's it. Every time I've moved three times, I've had armed police at my house, 
my wife, I've changed my kids' school, and each time I move and the police get my address, then it's out there. So they're leaking my address. So then I refuse to give them my address. When I was in court, I said, I'm not giving you my address. Because whenever I give you my address, people turn up at my house. My house gets attacked and I get attacked. And it's coming from you and someone within your police force. Then, they re- this was in the last two weeks, three weeks, we was at a meeting in um, the southwest. I came out of the meeting. I was walking. 